बाई नाउ यू ऑल नो माई नेम माई सेफ आकांक्षा आई एम वर्किंग एज ए मेम्बर ऑफ टेक्निकल स्टाफ एट कैस्टन कैस्टन बाई वीम सो टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट सिक्योरिंग क्यूबरनेटिस क्लस्टर्स विथ ओ आई डी सी सो हेयर इज द ब्रीफ एजेंडा दैट आई एम गोइंग टू कवर टूडे सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी विल टॉक अबाउट चैलेंजेस इन क्यूबरनेटिस रिलेटेड टू ऑथेंटिकेशन देन वी विल set some concepts on oidc then we will see one of the uh, common workflow for oidc and then we will see how kubernetes integrates with oidc and then we will wrap up the session by talking about uh, some benefits and the best practices of using oidc challenges in kubernetes related to authentication so in kubernetes we do have a concepts of user account but it does not provide a single built in mechanism to authenticate those accounts so uh, there are some of the basic mechanism but they do have a black, uh, drawbacks so we will see how oidc overcomes all of those so the first method uh, the basic authentication method is uh, static password file so what we do in this method is we have a password file where username and their password are written in the plain text and that is provided to the server so if you see this is uh, a easy way to configure but it's uh, the least secure so the file can uh, someone can gain access to the file and modify uh, that and uh, do uh, harmful operations to the kubernetes clusters if we talk about certificates this is also a way but the problem with certificates it is it requires a lot of manual con configurations and uh, also it does not works at scale so if you have a cluster where you are going to manage lot of user so it is not a, a good uh, i would say it is going to be complex to man manage all those users with certificates uh, we also have a way of service account token so this is simple to configure so in this you create a token you associate that with a service account in kubernetes and then you provide access to the service account and uh, perform operations accordingly but the problem with this is like uh, those tokens are basically uh, short lived so they are they expire after 24 hours so you need a way to refresh those tokens every time so that is the challenge with service account tokens okay uh, oidc we are going to cover now. introduction to oidc uh, it stands for open id connect and it is an identity layer on top of oauth 2.0 protocol uh, oauth 2.0 if if i talk a bit about it it mostly dealt with uh, allowing uh, application access data of other application on behalf of a user but in oidc along with the access information user information are also shared then it is most commonly used in sso scenarios and uh, some of the um, popular uh, identity provider that uh, supports oidc are google microsoft active azure directory uh, oauth and okta okay uh, before we jump into kubernetes with oidc i'll tell you about some of the ter terminologies that we are going to talk in uh, next few slides so first one is identity provider so these are the services that uh, authenticates user and provide user information clients are the one that requests user information from the uh, identity provider and it can be anything like uh, mobile application web application and uh, services as well then tokens so i've been talking about user information so they are shared in the form of tokens so we have access token id token and refresh token so id and access token are for the information but the refresh token is used to renew the id and access token if they expire uh scopes so scopes determine what level of permission that client is asking from the uh, identity provider so uh, we are talking about user information so let's say uh, the client can ask for email or maybe profile of the user so that goes into the scopes then flows so flow define how the client is going to uh, get the token from the identity provider so we have different flow based on how what type of client you have like mobile application or web application i'm going to talk about uh, authorization code flow this is uh, common and popular 
Okay, this is, I hope this is visible. So uh, this is authorization code flow and this is how the interaction between client and the identity provider happens. So way before this uh, interaction happens, uh, so you need to, as a client, you need to register yourself into the identity provider and you will get with the uh, client ID and client secret that you can use later to interact with the identity provider. So once that registration process is done, so let's say a user uh, requested for a resource. So what client does is it uh, sends a re uh, request to the identity provider at the authorized endpoint and uh, then uh, the request goes to the authorized endpoint and uh, uh, then the authorization server pops up a screen where it user is asked to authenticate themselves and uh, uh, so once let's say a user is authenticated, the authorization sends back a authorization code to the uh, client and then client uses that authorization code and it uses the client ID secret and the authorization code that is given to uh, and sends the uh, request back to the uh, authorization server at the token endpoint to get all the tokens. So then it gets ID token, access token and refresh token as well. Give me a second. Okay, uh, so let's say once the token is obtained for by the client, then it uh, extracts the token, uh, validates it, and then uh, gets the information and then uses the access token to access the resources. So this is the main workflow and uh, uh, these are the two main endpoints that are used in it. So authorize and the token. Okay, so Kubernetes OIDC workflow. So this workflow is from the Kubernetes official docs. And if you see, this is almost similar to what we discussed in the previous slide. But the only difference is how you are getting the token. So if you see, uh, so we in Kubernetes, we use kubectl. So kubectl being a console application, it does not provide us with a web browser. So uh, I mean, you either need to get the token manually or use some kubectl plugins to get the token for you. And then once you, so if you see, uh, once you log into or identity provider and you get the access token, ID token, and refresh token, you call the kubectl and provide the token as a token flag. And once uh, once uh, API server gets the token, it validates the token and then uh, it extract the user information and see if that user is uh, authorized to perform the operation that is requested and uh, then returns the result back to the uh, kubectl. So this is how this flow looks like. We will see the authorization part later in some slide. Configuring Kubernetes with OIDC. So uh, after this flow, let's say if someone wants to configure their Kubernetes clusters with OIDC. So there are uh, three main steps, and this is mostly common with all the identity providers. First one is configure your OIDC provider. So you need to register your client into the uh, identity provider and get the client ID and secret. Then second step would be to update your Kubernetes API server configuration. I mean. Uh, there are flags that are available like OIDC issuer URL, client ID, and uh, username claim. So you need to update those. And then at the end, you need to configure your kubectl so that those tokens could be provided to the kubectl. So either you can use the token flag or the KTS authenticator. So this authenticator sets your kubeconfig file accordingly so that you get the token. Uh, for your use. Okay, so authorization part. So if I go back a few slides, I was talking about this user authorized part. So let's say you get the token. Now, uh, Cube API server has validated the token. That means the user is authenticated. Now comes the authorization part, like what all operation the user can perform. So, so first of all, uh, there is a there is a field in the token that is pre-configured for mapping. So uh, let's say you have some of the information in the to uh, token, like email, uh, username. So one of the flags, one of the key is already configured to be used as a 
mapping. So what keep an, uh, what API server does is, is map the user information, uh, user key that is get, that we get from the token to one of the user accounts, and then it applies. Uh, it applies RBAC, and then let's say a, a user uh, request for a resource. Then it checks for the user account and the RBAC access that has that the uh, account has, and then uh, it gets back the result. So this is how the authorization takes place. So you have the ID token, you get a get a key from them, and then you map it to a user account, and then you. Uh, apply RBAC and then uh, QAPI server will automatically evaluate the RBAC. Uh, okay, so yeah, so QAPI server automatically evaluates the RBAC and then sends back the result. So uh, benefits of using OIDC. So these are some of the benefits that are listed. So centralized user management. So uh, with OIDC in place, you don't have to manage users inside the Kubernetes clusters. Uh, you can delegate those uh, requests to the identity provider. It also helps with, uh, let's say you have a multiple cluster. You don't have to manage users for all of them. You can just con uh, set them at one, at one place and then use them in multiple clusters. Second is improved security. So OIDC uses a um, uh, token-based approach. So you have your token that comes with the expiration, and you can also revoke the access. That, that is with the improved security. So if we talk about simplified authentication, so as a user, I do not have to remember uh, username and password for each of the clusters. I can just have one username password, and then I can uh, log into multiple clusters and perform operations. And hence, access control capabilities. So in identity provider, you can also, I would say, you can also uh, set up roles uh, and provide groups to the user. So and while getting the information, instead of ID, you can get the group information and then uh, map that to the Kubernetes cluster. So that also works. Best practices for OIDC implementation. So these are some of the best practices. Um, there are many more. I have listed few. So enable RBAC. So even though a uh, user is authenticated, uh, let's say you should always try to enable RBAC because uh, even though it is authenticated, they, uh, if they do not have RBAC set, they won't be able to perform any operations. Then regularly update your identity provider. Then implement MFA. And the important one is securely store and rotate client secret. So I was talking about this in like two, three previous slides. Uh, we get the client secret. Uh, so we should rotate it or, uh, accordingly and securely sto store it because that is, that, that is the one that, that, that is important for uh, identity provider to uh, authenticate the clients uh, using client ID and secret, and then regularly review and test the configurations. So these are some of the best practices. OK, I think uh, uh, this is a lightning talk, so we can't take questions, but you can connect to me offline, and then we can get your answers. Uh, thank you. That's all I had. Thanks, Akansha.